if Tesla is an AI story, guess what? That's a bubble story. And so I would just take that to mean, okay, Tesla is going to be part of the next bubble. Now, this is very early on in this bubble. I think this is probably the first wave. Have we seen the peak? I don't know yet. So Shanghai, from what I understand, approved the permits uh, for expansion of the Gigafactory there to 3 million vehicles. In this video, an extremely credible long-term Tesla bear who said such highly credible things as Tesla doesn't have anything that Toyota doesn't already have and Tesla is just a car company and the competition is coming and Tesla stock is egregiously overvalued, claims to have heard news that Tesla has been approved for a production capacity increase in Shanghai to 3 million units per year. One of the folks on Yahoo Finance suggests that Tesla is part of an AI bubble. Some new research from Morgan Stanley on Tesla's next potential money printer. And in other news, I posted a more than 20 minute Twitter subscriber only video today in which I react to a finance YouTuber admitting he deeply regrets selling Tesla stock. Well, imagine that, somebody is selling Tesla stock and later regretting it. Who could have seen that coming? Definitely not me. That's why I also regret, oh wait, I have never sold any, have I? I just keep buying, hmm. Awkward. Also posted a Patreon exclusive video today in which Mark Zuckerberg admits that he's learning a lot from Big Daddy Elon. Isn't that funny? The guy who doesn't know how to run a social media company is teaching a guy running a social media company how to run his social media company better. Hmm, how amazing. Couldn't have seen that coming either. Jeez, so many surprises, so little time. Wow. So check the links to the pinned comment, subscribe over on Twitter, join Patreon or don't, I won't be mad, but you will miss out on a lot of exclusive content. And then touching on you know two points you made earlier, on the software side and on will their cars charge as quickly as Tesla's. Those two are somewhat combined. Right. And so uh, it's likely that the vehicle on the vehicle side is going to be the constraint. So if they don't charge as quickly, that's something on the vehicle side. Uh, but it also ties into the software piece. So it's like how much mm -hmm. software is Tesla going to start deploying in Ford and GM's vehicles? Right. Is it just the API so they know which stalls are open? Is it also maybe the navigation to get there? Um, is it also the system that Tesla uses? They precondition their batteries when they're on the way to a supercharger so that they can charge faster. Uh, or does it go all the way to full self-driving, which is something that Elon tweeted about. It's inevitable over time, other companies will be licensing Tesla's FSD software. It's just a matter of when this happens, not if. It's been in my Tesla valuation model from the outset. If you don't have access to that, Check out the link in the pinned comment. Join Patreon at the investor level and above. It's a massive needle mover for Tesla, especially in terms of profitability later this decade. And if other automotive companies have any sense, which is extremely debatable, to be honest. I mean, after all these dips failed to notice the EV transition and now they're give or take a decade or more behind. And ultimately, most will still go bankrupt. So not sure if they do have sense, but if they have sense, there's going to be a gigantic line banging on Tesla's door. Hey, daddy, please hold our hand. We want everything. The thermal management software, FSD, your OS, everything. Please help us, Tesla. Tesla has invented the wheel. None of these other companies have developed a wheel. Does it make sense for them to try to reinvent the wheel and go bankrupt in the process? Or crawl to Tesla and ask to use everything Tesla's already developed and nailed, aka the wheel, giving them a much better chance of survival. This is what it comes down to. If they have sense, they want to survive. These two are connected. If they don't have sense and they don't want to survive, which seems to have been the case in the past, they're probably not going to be asking to license Tesla software, including the OS, FSD, thermal management, the whole kit and caboodle. But if they do have sense, it's only a matter of time. Let me give an analogy. Just imagine you're a company who wants to develop a smartphone. Just imagine if Apple were willing to license iOS, the alternative of course being Android. The difference here, Tesla is actually willing to license their software and Apple ain't. But just imagine you're developing a smartphone. You just want to manufacture the hardware. Would it make any sense at all to try and develop your own operating system? when others have already done so? I don't think so. If Tesla is an AI story, guess what? That's a bubble story. And so I would just take that to mean, okay, Tesla is going to be part of the next bubble. Now, this is very early on in this bubble. I think this is probably the first wave. Have we seen the peak? I don't know yet. So first, Tesla was just a car company, didn't have anything that any other companies didn't have and definitely wasn't an AI company. And now if Tesla is an AI company, they're part of an AI bubble, which will burst. Okay, if you say so, I beg to differ. I think the stonk market isn't really appreciating Tesla's unassailable lead when it comes to autonomy, the thing that's going to unlock a multi-decker trillion dollar opportunity. But hey, that's just me. I don't know anything. So we're looking at some of those big stock moves when it comes to Tesla. I want to look at one of the moves in your recent note. Over the last month, Tesla up more than 50%, the NASDAQ 100 up just about 11%. So give us a sense. Tesla's obviously a very widely held stock. 
How much of this upside move? Is this the supercharger deal and all the press around that? Is there something else moving this stock higher? So there's two things at play. One is the uh, the supercharger network and NACS. Um, obviously, very positive for Tesla. Everybody wants to speculate about how much money they're going to make. Um, you know, we really don't don't know. People are guessing because we don't know what pricing is going to be or if pricing is going to be um, identical or uh, greater than uh, Tesla customers for, for General Motors and Ford and Stellantis uh, uh, vehicle drivers to uh, to use the network. Second thing that's really in play is um, the uh, rear wheel drive Model 3. Mid, mid April, um, the federal uh, subsidy from IRA was cut to um, 37.50 from 7,500. Um, June 3rd, uh, it uh, quietly went back to 7,500. Um, so there's quite a lot of optimism around that. Um, and uh, we think it's misplaced. Um, but, uh, you know, these are these are obviously sort of optically positive things for Tesla. People want to own Tesla. It's a great company. It's category king. Um, and uh, they're, they're benefiting from the positive uh, headline momentum. All right, so you're saying misplaced. Uh, I, I just want to ask you, do you mean over exuberance or misplaced? Because the supercharger deal... Isn't this going to be recurring revenue over many, many years? So I was saying misplaced for um, the, uh, the the subsidy change, right? Okay, so the subsidy gotcha. change. So on the, the Model Three, you're talking field, about this is this is very positive, right? I always think Tesla uses misnomers, um, you know, like uh, full self driving and autopilot, because you know there is human intervention that's absolutely necessary, right? NACS, North American Charging Standard. That's another one that sounded pretty aggressive. And you know what? Give it to them. It looks like it's going their way. Um, when you have the largest OEMs adopting like this, um, you know, companies that are committed to the success of EVs, similarly to uh, to Tesla. Yeah, see, you know, clearly a lot of upside, Craig. It, it, clearly a lot of upside here. So we, we got to play the other side of it, though. Let's talk about is there any risk when it comes to this stock? Looking at EV adoption, now, only about 1% of all cars are electric, according to your research. That seems extremely bullish for Tesla. Is there any long-term risk in this name? So there are two huge risks in the, in the, in the stock right now. One is, what was the actual reason that, uh, that Elon Musk went to, uh, to, to, to Beijing? So Shanghai, from what I understand, approved the permits uh, for expansion of the Gigafactory there to 3 million vehicles. Wait, what? This is the same guy who's been telling us for years that Tesla was soon to announce a India Gigafactory. Still yet to see that factory. I'm not saying it won't come, but uh, did we miss this news? Has anyone heard this rumor that Tesla's Shanghai has now been approved for a capacity of three plus million vehicles per year? Now, don't get me wrong. I think over the long term, Tesla will be producing more than three million vehicles a year in China, inevitably, whether it's at Shanghai, whether it's multiple locations, TBC. But obviously, with the $25,000 vehicle soon to go in production, it's inevitable some of these will be built in China. Some of these will be built in Mexico. I mean, duh. But has anyone actually heard this? Is this a credible rumor? Or is Craig being fed misinformation or just making shit up? Serious question, by the way. I'm kind of hearing that that's not the case out of Beijing. I'm hearing that Beijing wants to protect its domestic market. Um, you know, BYD is a darling. Uh, Li Auto, Neo, and others are also, you know, essential to the Chinese economy. Um, I'm hearing that, you know, maybe, maybe there were permit problems and maybe they're left somewhere around a million. Um, they need 3 million units to do the 10 million that, that a lot of people are dreaming about right now. The fuck? Craig Owen has just said moments ago, rewind and fact check. He literally just said, Shanghai, from what I understand, has approved the permits for 3 million units per year in the same breath, the same sentence. He then goes on to say, very high inflection in his voice again, I'm not sure if it's testosterone deficiency or he just doesn't believe what he's saying, that he's not so sure that that's the case. After just saying that he just heard, huh? I don't understand. He's saying that he heard that they've been approved for 3 million and then in the same breath he's saying that he doesn't think that that's the case. The f*** is he talking about? And interestingly, seems like Craig doesn't even think 10 million vehicles per year is ever on the cards for Tesla, let alone 20. He must have been taking a lot of notes from the Mark Spiegel School of Capital and Reputational Destruction. Shout out to Mark Spiegel's 2014 post on Seeking Alfalfa. Why projections for Tesla to sell 500,000 vehicles a year in 2020 are absurd. Now over to Morgan Stanley's thoughts on Tesla's next money printer. Never know what you're gonna get from Morgan Stanley, so let's see what they have to say today. Tesla Financial Services. It's time. Price target, still, $200 per share. Wonder how long until Morgan Stanley chases after the stock price. Reverse engineers a ridiculous, vague reason as to why they've increased their price target, other than embarrassment for being wrong. 
and then gets roasted by some guy on YouTube who predicted ahead of time that they'd be increasing their price target with no material change to the investment thesis. For years, Tesla could sell a car for cash or minimal leasing. But as Tesla looks to acquire the next 5 to 10 million units, customers require new solutions in a market where 90% of vehicles are bought on a monthly payment. Then there's the IRA leasing loophole. We think the time for a full-line Tesla Finco, as in financial company, has arrived. In 1919, General Motors founded the General Motors Acceptance Corporation to provide financing solutions to its auto customers. Many auto historians cite this financial innovation as one of the most important drivers of mass adoption of auto ownership, rivaled only by the moving assembly line. Now, this may be a fair point. By the way, in totally unrelated matters, you know what else can enable more affordability of electric vehicles and mass adoption? Said vehicles being able to go and print you money while you're asleep by picking people up and dropping them off autonomously via full self-driving. Shout out to the robo taxis just around the corner. This is actually a core part of Tesla's master plan. They've literally articulated this. This is one of the ways for Tesla to enable people who couldn't ordinarily afford to buy a new vehicle, the adoption of an EV. Buy a Tesla, have it pay for its entire cost in a year or two. Just about anyone can afford that. If they can't, Morgan Stanley might have a point regarding financing. We think investors should prepare for Tesla to begin building a large, full-scale captive financing subsidiary as the market matures to facilitate the potential IRA leasing rules, which could become a major driver, and several other factors. Financing is the norm. The vast majority of cars are bought via a financial instrument. Now, just want to jump in here, and I'm going to sound like I'm contradicting myself, but bear with me, I'm not. If, as a consumer, you can't afford to buy something, buying that thing on credit is never a good idea. Caveats, being appreciating assets, which in fact may be Tesla vehicles in the future, potentially a home to live in because you can access that, pull capital out, it's almost like a gigantic ATM machine, other investment assets that can appreciate or produce cash flow. But generally speaking, most consumers who buy a car they can't afford on finance are financially brain dead. It's disturbing that it's the norm for people to buy things they can't afford and put them on credit. Depreciating assets that cost you money to own and lose value over time. Then again, most people worldwide just live paycheck to paycheck and literally have a financial IQ of about 12. It's embarrassing, like super embarrassing. That being said, people of more means who can afford to buy vehicles, assets completely outright with cash and have the option of buying via finance with a fairly low interest rate are usually insane not to use finance. For example, just imagine hypothetically speaking that you were an early Tesla stock investor, you bought an IPO. Then let's say it's 2018, 2019, you've made well over 10 times your money but you still believe that you could easily get another 10x from there. And spoiler alert, that's what's happened since. If at that point in time, you were to sell some of your Tesla stock in order to buy a Tesla vehicle, for example, with cash outright, as opposed to borrowing, financing at a very low interest rate, you probably have rocks in your head. And let me explain why. You always have to think, what is the potential return I could get on that cash if I borrow to buy the asset, e.g. the car, the Tesla, and then invest that cash somewhere instead? If you have a high level of confidence that you can get a much greater return by using that cash to hold or buy an asset that will appreciate and or produce cash flow and use debt to buy the asset, it's a no-brainer to use debt. I'm currently carrying literally millions of dollars of investment debt, personally. I pay a moderate interest rate, but the return I'm getting on that cash by holding those assets and using finance to accumulate more assets is much higher than the interest rate I'm paying. So it makes sense. But I've got to say, once again, people who buy things on credit use financing to buy depreciating assets that they can't afford to buy outright living in fucking financial clown world. It's just stunning that people put things like holidays on credit cards and finance cars they can't afford, usually just to keep up with the Joneses. The lack of financial discipline, financial literacy, just globally, stuns me. Rant over. Tesla is maturing. Early sales have been predominantly cash rather than financed, but in targeting multi-million unit volume, the company must facilitate an easier sales process. Competitive disadvantage. By not having a comprehensive financing offering, Tesla may be leaving sales on the table. Tesla affordability. Tesla has been cutting prices of its vehicles throughout much of the year, demonstrating its ability to fill the gap in the market for affordable vehicles vacated by the Detroit 3. And we look to further price cuts and a sub $25,000 Model 2 to continue to fill that gap. Further, Tesla applied a significant update to its online Model 3 design studio, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, we know all Model 3 versions now getting the $7,500 federal tax credit in the United States makes it more affordable. Great. Since the US Treasury Department came forward with its official guidance and rules related to the newly revamped US federal EV tax credit, there are very few options that qualify besides Tesla. Then there's the IRA leasing loophole. As it currently is written, leasing a clean vehicle could circumvent the restrictive battery and metal sourcing requirements, final assembly in North America, as well as MSRP and income limits associated with buying. 
The North American Final Assembly provision received pushback from foreign countries, particularly South Korea, whose OEMs Hyundai and Kia sell EVs in the US. European and Asian countries even considered filing a complaint with the World Trade Organization. Consequently, the IRS issued a fact sheet about the tax credit suggesting that the EVs made outside the US can still qualify for tax credits under Section 45W, the commercial vehicle section of the law, rather than Section 30D if the vehicle is leased by the taxpayer. For a leased vehicle, the commercial tax credit can be taken by the leaser. Dealerships can get $7,500 in tax credits for each leased EV, which could then be passed on to consumers in the form of reduced monthly lease payments. Please note that this is one interpretation of the law and subject to further iteration. Tesla's Model 3 and Model Y offering add to a limited lineup of low-cost US-made battery electric vehicles. Tesla's goal for up to 20 million EVs requires cost leadership to be shared with its customers. That is true, still most people don't seem to get this. Every time Tesla cuts prices, it's the end of the world, not Tesla following through on their publicly stated master plan. If Tesla doesn't drive lower, then someone else, like Chinese OEMs, likely will. Tesla leasing as it currently stands. Challenges. To our knowledge, there is currently no consumer buyout option for new leases in the US for a Model 3 or Model Y at the end of their lease term. This is also my understanding. Tesla has publicly said, you ain't going to be able to buy this thing at the end because its value will probably have increased so significantly, we don't want to give you the option. Why so significantly? Autonomy being solved. All Tesla vehicles delivered on or after April 15, 2022 are not eligible for purchase at the end of the lease. Additionally, the option to lease a Tesla is not available nationwide. Tesla is in the midst of an industry-wide EV price competition with potentially falling margins and EV market de- Ah, <laughs> oh, yay, yay. They just don't get it. An EV market deceleration, if you say so, Morgan Stanley. Still growth, but at a slower rate. If the company wasn't benefiting from significant government incentives and price cuts, we question how much cash flow Tesla would be generating. Within our coverage, we see Tesla as relatively best positioned to navigate the geopolitical and economic challenges inherent in rewiring the EV battery supply chain. More than an AI play, we believe Tesla's role in building a de-risked EV supply chain is underappreciated by the market. Tesla Finco seems to us the logical next opportunity to support further top-line growth. Skipping ahead a little bit here, we think Tesla is well positioned to reap the benefits of a well-managed, conservative profit generator, the Finco. Below, we compare key metrics across legacy OEM Fincos. By the way, guys, I'll talk more about this in a moment, but um, this ain't gonna end well for these legacy automotive companies. Captive Finco manage receivables. This is in billions. BW, over 200. BMW, around 150 billion. Ford, maybe 130 billion. Toyota, about the same. GM, maybe 125 billion. Honda, about 75 billion. Now here's the problem. Receivables, this means consumers have yet to pay off, right? They borrow from the automotive manufacturer themselves, their finance arm, e.g. a VW customer uses VW Finance to buy a VW vehicle. VW then secures that debt against the asset they're purchasing, the vehicle, and then the consumer over time pays off the loan. Makes sense, right? That's a simplified version. Here's a problem. If a consumer, for whatever reason, decides or just cannot make repayments anymore, that's fine, you can just seize the asset because it's still valuable, right? It's worth a lot more than the remaining debt, right? Well, that's the way things are today, but guess what's gonna happen when the value of ICE vehicles collapses and consumers who have leases on ICE vehicles no longer wanna drive ICE vehicles. Gonna have increasing defaults, people getting behind on payments, stopping payments entirely, gonna fuck it. I'm not even gonna pay this thing anymore. Let's just say hypothetically that VW has, call it $200 billion of debt from their finance business, all secured against internal combustion engine vehicles. And let's just say in the next five years, the value of the internal combustion engine vehicles that debt's secured against halves to $100 billion. Now VW has a $100 billion hole. That's probably not going to end well. Just wanted to put that on the record. This is rarely talked about, but it's one of the huge hurdles that's likely to accelerate the bankruptcy of legacy automotive companies. Ain't gonna end well. If you guys want to look at these, feel free to pause. We're looking at Finco equity value over Finco total assets. The bigger, the better. The more equity, the better. The more wiggle room. For example, if the value of Honda vehicles collapsed by, let's just call it about 25%, they'd still be okay. If the value of VW assets secured against their debt dropped by that same amount, VW would be in big trouble. They'd be billions of dollars in the red. We can also see Finco lease and loan penetration. This, in essence, is the percentage of customers who've purchased a vehicle and financed it as opposed to purchase it outright with cash. We can see Tesla here, a spec. Honda, more than 50% of customers buying their vehicles doing so with financing. Toyota, same boat. I mean, this is gonna be a cataclysmic implosion. Don't say I didn't warn you. And now more reasons from Morgan Stanley as why Tesla should do a Finco. Monetization opportunity. Provides a feeder loop to used car sales, certified pre-owned Tesla units to make more money in downstream. Keeps Tesla cars in the network longer. 
Flexibility in model. Fits with subscription model. Can change monthly payment terms more or less frequently versus sticker price, which is more of a shock. Sufficient scale. Tesla has a strong balance sheet and enough cash to build a Finco, in our opinion. Now it also has the downstream network to service and execute. Partnership opportunity. In our opinion, banking and ABS partners would likely be happy to work with Tesla, an established high quality company with strong consumer fundamentals. Marketing optionality. With a Finco, Tesla can run other more creative and subtle marketing and promotional campaigns besides advertising and price cuts. Downstream exposure. A Finco would help manage residual risk better by having more exposure to the downstream. Brand loyalty. Contributes to improve loyalty and stickiness as a leasing customer is more likely to come back for a new vehicle later and the company can work with the customer ahead of lease term expiry to keep them in the brand. Leasing also requires more regular maintenance and upkeep of the vehicles, more of a chance to make financing spread and P&S revenue. With so much attention going towards the increasingly well-supplied EV market these days, we wanted to take a moment to remind investors of the importance of captive financial services operations. Fincos can function as a key driver of sales and steady profit underpinning the parent company's fundamentals and cash flow generation. <laughs> oh, this is funny. During good times, the credit subsidiary can magnify profitability of the franchise. In more challenging times, the Finco has the potential to represent a call on cash and just out of interest. For example, Ford Finco EBIT contribution as in how much money out of all the profits Ford is producing is coming from their financial services. In blue here, percentage terms, 2015 is probably about 15%, 2021, almost 40%. So yeah, remember that. What would happen, say for example, if the profitability on these Finco's went negative for, I guess, the automotive manufacturers whose profits in some cases as much as one third or more coming from said financial services company? Something to ponder, isn't it? So to recap, Tesla's so-called competition, if they have any sense whatsoever, which is debatable, will be begging Tesla for access to literally everything they possibly can get their hands on. FSD, the thermal management software, OS, you name it, they'll want it if they're smart. Again, that's debatable. But supposedly, according to someone very credible on Yahoo Finance, Tesla may be part of an AI bubble. I guess it's only a matter of time until the Tesla AI bubble bursts then. Craig Irwin claims to have knowledge that Tesla has been improved for a 3 million per year capacity expansion in Shanghai and then seconds later says that that's not actually the case. Morgan Stanley talk about Tesla's next potential money printer and somehow miraculously failed to mention the incredible risk built into other automotive manufacturers' financing businesses. The ones whose asset value is secured against literally hundreds of billions of dollars of debt in some cases is set to soon collapse. It's weird they didn't mention that once. I wonder if they don't know. And in other news, Tesla's record run has finally come to an end. Wonder how long until the record will be broken once again. And if you'd like more content, don't forget to check out the new videos I've posted today on Twitter subscriptions and over on Patreon. And yes, just to be clear, the stuff on Patreon you'll only find there, the stuff on Twitter subscriptions you'll only find there. Athletic Greens AG1 has given me a massive meaningful boost in energy, allowing me to do a lot more every day, including using my brain more and using my body more. I highly recommend you guys and girls check it out. Athletic Greens AG1 is an excellent way to fill in nutritional gaps. It's got 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, and whole food source nutrients, plus prebiotics and probiotics and digestive enzymes and adaptogens to help you deal with stress. Plus, if you click the link in the pinned comment or head to drinkag1.com slash SMR, you can get yourself a one year free supply of vitamin D3 and K2. But don't take my word for it. Here's what some of you guys and girls have to say. AG1 has changed my life. I was, as you described, treating myself like a circus, ate like trash, rarely exercised, used alcohol as a stress crutch, cannabis also. AG1 is what gave me the kick in the ass, got me back to the gym, motivated me to do more for myself, family, my business, etc. Keep doing what you do. Now, I know there's some skeptics, the same kind of people who think Elon Musk is a fraud reading this going, what do you thought? There's no way that's possible, bro. It must be a placebo effect. Believe it or not, this is a recurring theme. If you give your body everything it needs to feel and perform its best, including having a lot more energy, you'll need ways to use that energy. For me personally, that includes more exercise, moving my body more, more social activity, and more cognitively demanding tasks, including producing a fuck ton of exclusive content over on Twitter and on Patreon, plus my daily YouTube uploads. The proof's in the pudding. On to another testimonial from a viewer of this channel. SMR, you asked me to provide feedback on AG1. Here it is. It has helped with mental acuity, stamina, and intestinal waste management. Uh, can't read between the lines. It certainly helps with regularity and digestion. That's what the digestive enzymes are for. It has also dramatically reduced my cravings for sugar. You guys need to stop eating sugar. It's fucking poison. I'm 50, 5'9", and overweight, aka a fat motherfucker. I think that's a technical term for overweight, isn't it? Is it fat motherfucker or obese? I can't remember. I average 100 hours a week in the West Texas oil fields as a safety supervisor. Jesus Christ, dude. No wonder you're struggling to keep your weight under control. 100 hours a week. Brutal. It has helped me lose weight. 
It is not an appetite suppressant. It can help fat people suppress cravings and motivation to be healthier is critical for changing your diet. Love you, brother. Again, this is a great point. It's something people really don't seem to grasp. If you have more energy, everything becomes easier. It's like turning on easy mode for life. A few years ago, before I was taking AG1, my health was trash. I was struggling to get through the day, had afternoon fatigue. The last thing I wanted to do was either use my brain or move my body. Didn't have the energy. Now, my biggest struggle every day is figuring out ways to use that energy. I'm exercising way more, doing a lot more with my friends and family, and of course, my work output has increased substantially. And you can fact check me. Check out the average length of my videos I was posting to YouTube three years ago. Need I say more? And one final testimonial. Love this one. Okay, here's the deal for me with this AG1 shit. I'm 41 years old and not the type to eat, drink, smoke, or sleep healthy, so I was skeptical. That being said, here's what I experienced. Day one, meh. Day two, afternoon fatigue was about 45 minutes late. Day three, zero afternoon fatigue. Day four, zero afternoon fatigue plus extra energy. Day five, again, zero afternoon fatigue plus energy. Wondering, what the f really? See, this is the thing, right? The results for many people are just almost too good to be true. This, this is the same experience I had. My afternoon fatigue just vanished out of nowhere. I'm like, wait, what the f Why am I not tired in the afternoons anymore? Surely, it's not that AG1, is it? Turns out it was. Day six and seven, same thing. Day eight, same thing. Plus, I had the want to get things done around the house that I normally would slack off and not get done. Again, the point, extra energy, you'll need to use it, you'll find ways to use it. Day 9, 10, and 11, and today is day 12. I fucking love it. So however you managed to get me to buy it, I'm so glad you did. Thank you so much, SMR. It really changed me so far. Guys, this shit really works. Just try it. By the way, this is the reason I continue to relentlessly promote AG1. A lot of people get real fucking mad in the comments. Oh my god, snake oil salmon sold out. Oh my god, he's a scammer. This is fraud, but... Constantly, I'm pretty sure everyone making these comments is also currently short Tesla stock. I'm not particularly concerned about people having a negative perception, those folks suffering from small brain syndrome, still living in my bum's basement syndrome, etc., writing mean comments, claiming AG1's a scam or it doesn't work. I mean, bro, when I get feedback like this, this is what keeps me going. And remember, there is a 90-day money-back guarantee. There's nothing to lose here. Just try this stuff for a month, and if you don't get these results, get your money back. See, it's a literal no-brainer. It's an IQ test at this point in time. Testimonial after testimonial after testimonial like this. Get your money back if it doesn't work. Just try it for a month and if it doesn't work, get your money back. Today's the day. It's finally time. Be like this guy who was a massive skeptic, but finally, after a thousand promotions in a row, caved in, tried AG1 and has results like this. Head to drinkag1.com slash SMR or click the link at the pinned comment and please let me know how you're feeling in a few weeks time. Now, if you'll excuse me, time to put my extra energy to good use. I'll be recording some more exclusive content for Patreon and my Twitter subscribers. So click the links in the pinned comment See you over on Twitter and or Patreon. And don't forget to grab your AG1. Love ya.